machine. Hi there, it's Claire Lim here and welcome to Hot Pod Time Machine. This is the podcast where we explore a decision from our past that changed the trajectory of our future. And I'm very happy to welcome on this episode we have, it's James Northcote. Hello, James. Hey, hello, Claire. Hi. Now, How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Before we get straight into what this is all about, um, I wanted to ask you, when I approached you with the subject of the podcast, what was going through your mind? So I, so I have to admit, I've seen some of your hot pod content on your socials. So I had some idea of what it was, but I didn't really get how it's so... That it's something to do that really is something to do with time travel. So I, I think immediately I start thinking about that there's that film that is called like what's it Hot Tub Time Machine, which I think I have seen probably in in probably like 30 different sections, like watching it like a bit. When you turn it on, you're like, oh, I'll watch that for a bit, and then that's quite that's funny, and then you turn it off again. Um, so I think I kind of imagined that there'd be some kind of twist, that there'd be some kind of switcheroo and that i'd be thrown in to the deep end but that it would probably be a deep end that was only as deep as a hot tub once you got into it (laughs) this is like our streams (laughs) long metaphors long long metaphors i I love it at one point when we're streaming i'm gonna have to get one of the mods to supercut all of the the lovely language that you use to get us into segues to push us forward I love all of that. Love it. Love it. For those uh, watching, listening along who don't know, uh, me, James and Mark, we do um, a thing called No Walls. You can follow on No Walls Live on Twitch. We'll do all the socials later, but it's very fun. Um, okay, so a decision from our past that changed our future. It's, it's quite a lot. We make decisions every day. You know, you could like mm. decide to put on a different pair of socks and that could change your future. So what, what did you think of what came to mind? Well, you have thrown this at me really last minute, so I, I'm absolutely not prepared for this. But I think that the probably the biggest decision from my past that's affected my future is I took a job. Uh, it was my second professional job as an actor, and it was to play, I think, player two in uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead on, in the West End. So amazing with a director called Trevor Nunn, who's like one of the most famous uh, theatre directors England has ever created. And uh, Tim Curry was going to be in it. Whoa. I know, you, right? So, I mean, I, I'm, like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an actor starting out. I've, I've, done, I've done quite a cool film. Like, I've, I'm, you know, I'm making my way and I'm like, should I do maybe zero lines slash maybe one line in this show but it has tim curry in it yeah. and it's directed by maybe like one of the greatest directors uh, in the world and i i thought about it for quite a while and i went you know what yeah i'm gonna do it i'm, gonna, I'm definitely gonna do it uh, i haven't i haven't been able to do theater professionally yet i love theater i've always wanted to do theater and and tim curry's in it yeah. okay tim curry's in it <laughs> and um we 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 did all the rehearsals. We went. We first went to a place in the UK called Chichester. That's where we started. It was kind of co-production, and then we took it into the West End. But Tim Curry didn't last. Oh. We lost him. In, we lost him. I think on on pre, pre, preview night, he was just like he just wasn't. He wasn't doing that well. He was. He was. He was getting to an age where you know maybe stage acting wasn't like what he really wanted to be doing, you know, physically, and he was such an incredible person to get to work with to like through the rehearsals like through the first performances it was literally like a dream and then he stepped off and an amazing understudy called chris andrew mellon uh, took his place and, and and then did the rest of the run which is was a really beautiful experience but uh we lost him curry so that was that was a big moment in my life but the reason it's so important is it was like that first job that you really form a really important group of friends around. And more importantly, it's where I ended up meeting my wife. So I met my wife on that job. I met my best man on that job. Wow. Uh, and and, and uh, that whole kind of... Uh, that whole kind of group uh, has really like stayed in touch. And it was like this... I, I don't know, it was like this kind of blissful summer of rehearsing a play with Tim Curry, 
and then not getting to do the play with Tim Curry, but still getting to do the play and, you know, falling in love and making amazing friends. And, you know, that was, it was that, that I think, choosing to do that show, even though it meant I had no lines and I had to play the flute, which was not what I was wanting, not what I wanted to be doing with my career. Um, it was, it was, that was, I think that, that moment and that choice, that's probably had most effect on my life, particularly because it's where I met my wife. Okay, I've got I've got some questions. We'll we'll start with your wife. We'll end on the flute. Um, but I wanted to. <laughs> that that sounds like a terrible euphemism. <laughs> That's I am so sorry. To anyone. You certainly will not start my wife, and will not end on the flute. <laughs> I'm very sorry to James' lovely wife. Um, okay, let's start with you know when you met your wife. Okay. Yeah. Was it that moment where you were like, was it love at first sight? Do you believe in that? Or was it like, oh, you're interesting. I'm intrigued. Tell me about those, that first moment. I, I think it was, you're, you're interesting, I'm intrigued. Because we, I, we were both in relationships at the same time. We didn't, we didn't get together until like quite late through the run. Even actually, maybe it was after after the run but looking back on it you realize that you were falling in love with someone do you know what i mean i i think there's those relationships that start off as a kind of a new friendship that you're like this person's great and mm. i'm not even sure if they like me that much or maybe they hate me but there's you know there, there's there, there, we've got a good there's there's something interesting happening here and you don't see it as necessarily becoming the relationship that's gonna be the rest of your life but when you look back on it, you go, oh no, all of the all of the pieces were there, even from that very, very first meeting. And I remember me the very first meeting with her and uh, it, we were just sitting in one of those squares, beautiful squares in London that are just randomly in the center of town with houses all around. And you think, who the hell lives in this, this square with this park in the yeah. middle, like off Oxford Street or something. Um, and I sat, down, we sat down, I sat down on the floor with her and some of the other cast members and I kind of looked over at her and went, yeah, she's she's very that that's she's very very beautiful. That's a very very beautiful person. Um, uh, but I didn't think any any further than that because obviously I was I was in a relationship and I you know just just started a you know new job. I wasn't going. That's going to be the love of my life. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't I wasn't really in that mindset. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, when I when I trace it back, it was it, it's all completely obvious. Completely it's, obvious. It's funny that when you are, it's not the right time. But you, you're, the universe or whatever you want to call it is putting the right person in front of you, but it's mm. the, the the path isn't there yet. Yeah. It's it's funny too when you think back on it with hindsight, you go, God, actually, it was so like you said, so obvious. It's like mm. you know, when was there a point even when you were in the relationship and you were you know going through this experience uh, with the theatre and with the job that you were like, I don't know, did it. That feeling you're like, oh no, wait a minute, oh wait, you know that kind of like turning of the head where you're like, hold on, this is this is this is a real this is a thing, or do you think it was just like a kind of oh, okay, surprise later? It's weird. It was a weird thing to explain, I guess, falling in love, you know? Yeah, I I mean I think I can't I I think I do know the moment, and. But I'm sort of not sure I want to describe it. Oh, Do you know what I mean? Okay, you don't have to describe it. Not because it, not because it's like, like particularly intense or, but because I, I don't know. It, it feels like it's, it's really that's a really special moment. I'm not sure I'd ever want to. No, don't describe then. it to anyone. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, but yeah, of course I do. There, there, there was a, there was definitely, a, definitely a moment, and uh, that's very clear in my mind. I love that. Um, I love that because there are those kind of moments where you're like, when you think back to your time in, in relationships, whether they are still existing or not, and you go, yeah. "Oh yeah," like very private moments, or it could be something that someone says or does, or something that they wear, or the laugh, or it's so weird how the human brain works. I I feel when you think of it like that, and your brain goes, "Oh wait a minute, I li I really do like you. <laughs> like we're so messed up. <laughs> it's so annoying." But yeah, falling in love is a wonderful thing. And it's so wonderful you met so many friends on that, yeah, that summer as well. Yeah. Like so That's it. And it's amazing when you stay in touch with people from a from a from a really early experience like that. Because often you just don't. Often you you kind of you drift apart, particularly for for actors, I think, because we do jobs together really intensely for a very sh often quite a short amount of time and you become really, really close friends with people and then often you don't really 
manage to maintain that the, definitely not that level of intimacy and connection that you had with those people when you when you were working together and that i think for i think for all actors you you kind of you're like oh those were the friends that got away Mm, Do you know, uh, know which I know. yeah which, which you know it's a beautiful thing. it's a beautiful thing we get to meet so many people that we can really that we really connect with and we really like working with uh, even if they don't stay friends with us you know as part of our lives for the rest of our lives what was it about the chemistry of that job specifically that kind of held you all together because it sounds very special because you know I, I know what you mean like you know you do a job you know and then all of a sudden that's job and you you are intensely friends with someone for like weeks sometimes mm. days or weeks you're like wow i love this person mm. and then they're gone you're like oh don't really don't really, don't really they're gone like a, we're, we're just, just, like a puff of smoke <laughs> yeah yeah like a genie they're just gone and i go oh yeah. we were like best friends for like you know three days but still it was it's a nice experience so what was it about that chemistry with all of you guys you think kept you i think it was a really specific job it was really intense because obviously we were working with Tim Curry and then and then we lost him. So there was loads of changes happening around us, like cast changes, uh, you know, understudies stepping up into massive roles, going to, we're going to the West End, like, to, you know, one of the biggest places for theatre in the world. I think it was the intensity, but also the fact that there was this group of us who played like the players and my wife played one of the, like a courtier, I think, in that job. Um, and... It, we actually had almost zero responsibility. Like we, we, like we, we took a lot. Probably took quite a lot. Like me particularly, because I'm such a, I'm such a, uh, like a dweeb when it comes to acting. I took way. Too, like I was like, you know, and I'm going to practice my understudying role and I really like, you know, go out into the park and like walk it out. But in reality, it was a, just a lovely, lovely time, and there was not a huge amount of pressure on us, and we could just enjoy being being actors and getting to do this incredible job and being together and i think those jobs like quite rightly are rare because most most acting jobs there's loads and loads of responsibility and you you really have to be on it and like there's a lot of pressure on you and you've got to, you've got to live a day after day after day and i think on this job because we were part of this ensemble and then there were all these these brilliant leads who were playing jamie parker and sam barnett and uh, and and chris andrew mellon who, who in, in the end played the player like they were leading the show and we were kind of just following them and supporting them and that was just a nice place to be in a really really nice way to spend the summer and you mentioned so we're gonna end with the flute you mentioned the flute uh now yeah. you had to play the flute uh, you know for this role how long are you, do you still play the flute and how long have you been playing for so i played i learned the flute when i was probably six or eight years old and it it was it was after a long list of instruments that i was particularly bad at so there wasn't it wasn't like i'm a very very gifted musician um i tried the recorder horrible i tried the violin horrible somehow got to the flute and i think it's because i quite like as a child i quite liked the idea of that i was like a little elf in the woods <laughs> what a thing to watch as a child <laughs> Little elf in the woods. Um, I I was like I can, I can I'm going to learn this. I'm going to learn this goddamn flute. I'm going to get it learned. Yeah. And I I so I, I so I took to it quite quickly. And I I I, did, I guess in you know in my late teens I was pretty good at it. And did all the grades and all that kind of stuff. And then I sort of dropped it at university because you know you don't go to university and start start your university experience being like guys I'm the flute guy. I don't you know guys. if you know, but I'm the gosh damn flute guy. I'm starting um, a thing, you guys. It's flute club. You can't talk about it. That's the first rule. <laughs> That's the first rule, flute club. You know, you and yeah. I play the flute, James. We we could start a flute club. See, see, so I know that we share this. We do, we do know that the flute is at once like the coolest instrument and also potentially one of the least cool instruments it doesn't help that that there's that moment in american pie that from our for our generation kind of ruined ruins the flute as a cool instrument or did um, it make it cool or does it make it cool that's maybe it makes it cool you know you know maybe it makes it cool legitimize uh, the flute basically american yeah. pie legitimized flute playing for all of us people that grew up with american pie because i just learned the flute because i was a music dork so I was just like, well, you, was... you know, lots of instruments, like right. You're you're you're, you're very musical. Yeah, I, 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 my dad's really musical, and um, we could, like you know, my my parents aren't particularly arty arty, but like my 
my uncle's an architect and he's an artist so like there's art oh, wow. in the family but like we um i really enjoy just the, the feeling of being very good at some of a musical instrument because it felt like if you could do that it's very impressive like mm. it's, and it's you can now this is where i'm going to sound like a music wanker but i don't know if you're going to share this i'm going to ask you this in a second but it felt like when i'm playing the flute or even when i'm singing these days or when i'm playing guitar it's the one time where I feel emotion. That sounds terrible. It's the one time where I feel, you know, I'm really feeling it from right inside. Because a lot of the time I'm just paying bills. I'm just trying to get things done. I'm learning, mm. you know, stuff to interview people. But that is the one thing where it feels like I'm expressing myself through the words I'm saying and singing and through the, the music I'm playing. So that always felt like a great release to me, not just being mm. expert, but a real release of something inside which sounds I'm, i sound like a total wanker saying it like that but that's how i felt no no not at all that's how i still feel actually yeah. what about you did you do you feel that way about music listening to it and playing it I, I think that music particularly for me as like as a teenager and even pl and playing music mm -hmm. like was definitely like an emotional definitely an emotional experience and so yeah a way that you would express yourself but but maybe express yourself to yourself more than necessarily to other people just in in playing it w when you wanted to play it um and you know find new things and and try yeah trying new ways that you could express yourself with it i think that like because i was a singer as well but i i never actually felt because <laughs> i was one of these people i was one of these <laughs> lads who was a young like high voiced singer okay right uh in a choir i was a choir boy that's why i'm saying I'm, that's why i'm telling you on this <laughs> podcast i was a choir boy it's okay. um, it's flute club. we can admit it. this this to each other in flute club we can admit <laughs> we're very honest in flute club it's all good <laughs> uh and so I, I think the experience of singing for me therefore never really became particularly emotionally connected because it was this voice that I like stopped using and, and then picked up this new voice, which was like a tenor voice, which never, ever felt particularly like my own. And so I think the flute in some ways, the flute is like a voice, it's definitely a voice like instrument and but a voice like instrument that you kind of can rely on and you can sing through it in a, in a way. And I think I think I just I enjoyed that part of it. It just felt like this very pure voice that I could sing with in a, in, in in some respects. And gosh, damn it, this is getting really uh, really emotionally. Um, uh, <laughs> you did not honest. expect. No, no this, I thought I was just going to be in a hot tub pod. <laughs> you should have done your research. You should have listened this is true. before. You should have done. This I is did. True. I gave you the link. Um, no, it's fine. We we like to meander and talk about everything and for i think i like this subject because for me uh music and art mm. are like two things that have that I, that are maybe not obviously things that i think people relate to me because of my work but i they are things that are absolutely integral to my soul you know yeah. and it's an interesting thing you make about choir because i used to be in the choir as well and um i was like the lower the lower end of this or like middle low whatever alto alto is it alto yeah but i hated yeah. the choir because i felt like you you were just standing yeah again you, yeah you're not really feeling your voice you're just going la 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 that's you know you're just being a monkey you know you're just monkey see monkey do whatever like and i i completely agree yeah i yeah that was very much my experience of choir yeah i didn't really enjoy it it wasn't until no. i played guitar and i started writing my own lyrics or mm. singing other people's lyrics but it feels like very private even though you, i will i think i've only just understood that about performing on stage in my adult life I, and I, I want to ask you about that in a second as well but performance i used to think oh you're performing on stage of course you're performing to people no matter what you're doing and that would embarrass me that scared me mm -hmm. um, i didn't like anything live and i used to play guitar to the, the amp and no one would get my face and get my back because I was so scared. Um, but now I realize that it's no, it's for you. It can be a private moment as well. You can get lost in what you're doing and it feels like it's not that exposing. And if it is, maybe does it doesn't really matter that much. Mm. But th those are the steps I've gone through in my head to kind of make, make myself feel better about it. Mm. But what about you? Like, do you still get, not stage frights, but do you still 
get that feeling of being scared? Do you still feel nervous when you have to perform in front of people? Yeah, 100%. Uh, and, I, and I'm not sure that I'd want it to be any other way because I, I think the, not the fear, but I think that, that adrenaline that you get just comes with, it's just part of, part of the nervousness and that adrenaline is not something that I'd want to completely get rid of uh, because it's a real thrill. It's, I think it's part of the thrill of performing is, the, is that feeling. Um, I've definitely become more at ease with myself as a performer, but I, but then at the same time, I also feel like that's actually kind of a risky place to be because you constantly want to keep developing and learning and changing and, you know, finding new versions of yourself, particularly as an actor, um, that you can explore and play with and, and, and it turn into characters. So I, uh, yeah, I, I sort of, I've become better at embracing the nerves. Uh, I think that's that's what I've become better at, uh, but I but I still definitely definitely get them, definitely yeah. definitely get them. But I th now I just try and surf them rather than paddle up. The, like like uh, for, as a surf metaphor, I I'm I'm much better now at just being like you know what I'm going to go with this feeling rather than being like I'm going to try and paddle over this wave of anxiety and try and get over the top of it and hopefully I'll I'll lose I'll get to the other side. It's like no no no, I think I'm just going to have to. This is the wave I'm on. I'm yeah. taking this wave. Yeah, you use it. You use it. Yeah. I think yeah. for you, maybe slightly, I've never acted, I have acted on a stage, but that, that was 14, you know, and mm -hmm. that doesn't count for me. But like, it's uh, in my adult life, I've never acted on stage. I have, I do live stage stuff. Mm -hmm. but, but for me, the, the, the mask or the shield for me is the fact that no one cares about me. They care about the other person I'm talking to. So I will always have that other person and it feels very comfy i'll go on and i'll say what i need to say and then do that stand-ups maybe the most exposing thing you can do because oh wow yeah it's just i, I couldn't do that I quite it's like, incredible but why couldn't i love it actually i, I really like the feeling of do you? yeah i like the feeling of being mm. stripped naked almost but, but why would you not do stand-up if you but how do you equate that to be different I, I, honestly, I think it's actually it would be coming up with the material. That's 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 um, what I think I'd find really really difficult. I I went to university with a lot of comedians and still know a lot of comedians, and I think that even though I did actually quite a lot of comedy at university as a student and really enjoyed it, it was my favourite thing to do as a performer because it was just so fun. I I learnt in some ways I think I learned to respect the process of comedians so much that I was like that's not something I have the skill for like the writing and creating of comedy like the the understanding of jokes and like the way jokes can be made and how you can you know how it's almost how it's almost as much a science as it is an art uh i uh yeah i think I, i've got such a healthy respect for comedians that i was like i i will leave that well alone it's, um, it <laughs> like is... i think com comedy acting is definitely something i love doing when i get to do it but but yeah stand up like that pure like this is my these are my jokes this is my slot this is my time yeah i think that's uh that's probably slightly beyond my um my powers if you if you were to write a stand-up set though not asking you to do one now we're not going to, to try and improv <laughs> don't worry i'm not going to scare you completely james is like oh my god this is like the worst what am i gonna do <laughs> what am i gonna do but if you were because like for me i just write about my life and then i just change bits like it's, yeah. it's just storytelling i guess some people go surreal you know and they go completely off the off the script yeah. what kind of comedian or what kind of stand-up do you think you would be comfortable with writing if you had to give it a go well, okay. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna plug my computer into the power because I realised that it's just on battery, so it's about to die. So that, that's how I'd start my stand-up routine. <laughs> so I I go straight off stage and I'd be like, uh, I'll be back in one second. Okay, okay. And I come back and I'd be like, Hey guy, hey guys, whoa, off stage, that was a crazy trip. <laughs> just uh, getting putting the power back on my on my computer. Whoa. <laughs> Have you, seen back, have you seen backstage? <laughs> surreal comedy then. It's like, oh, or, is, or what is the socket and where's the wire? Oh. I, I think what I would love, I don't, have you seen, there's a comedian called Doc Brown who um, was a, it's like, it's, it's a sort of a type of clowning. Uh, and sometimes his whole, like set, whole sections of his sets are, I think, entirely silent. Like I, I, I really, I love clowns. I, well, no, that's not necessarily true. I'm not sure I love clowns, but I love clowning. I love the, like the art of clowning, I think is incredible. And um, I'd, so I'd love to do anything that was 
slapstick or uh, like inadvertently amusing rather than rather than purposefully telling jokes i think if i could do any kind of uh stand-up set it would just be me falling over repeatedly so you'd be an um, actor you'd be, it would be like acting you'd be like clowning and acting kind of th- I, I I, yeah i think so yeah, yeah okay i suppose it's like you um fall into what you're comfortable with so if people are wanting to go surreal they go surreal i just like telling stories I, I don't think I'd do the slapstick very well because that would make me too much in my own head because I'd be like, have I fallen properly? Is this the, as an adequate? Am I an adequate clown? <laughs> like I, I would, I'd be questioning it too much. That would be my problem. There's something. Which is why, where's why I love it because I'm like, it's just falling over, just falling over. <laughs> like I don't know, in a funny way, that sounds like I can do that. <laughs> I can. Oh, I, I tell you what, we could do a duo. And I will just tell stories and you can maybe enact them by falling over, like in the different ways that you can fall over. So we can maybe do that. It can kind of be surreal. It can kind of be weird. Like, I quite like that idea of doing something weird. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to make you do it in real life, James. I know, I know. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Small... I know, I know this This is a safe space. I know the hot, hot pod is a safe space. A small tear starts to form in his eye. Oh, God. Oh, God. No. no. Um, something you said earlier um, actually interested me. You were talking about how you, as a performer, as an actor, you're now a lot more comfortable with where you are, but that can sometimes not be a good place because you want to push yourself. I wanted to ask as a storyteller, as a creative person, how how do you push yourself? You know, it's difficult because you've got a little one, you know, your dad. I do. You I do. are working jobs where you're like, right, I just, I'm getting through the jobs and I've got to enjoy them as I enjoy them. You've got other projects on the go. So how do you find time to explore? How, what's that process look like, do you think? That's a very good question. Um, and I think definitely a very good question for any new parent. <laughs> when do you find time to explore? Um, I, I think I'm still massively, massively inspired by other people's work. And sometimes I don't think that we talk about that enough as artists or actors or whatever. It's like how much like watching the work of other people can inspire us and makes us like want to be, want to find new new parts of ourselves or want to try different you know diff- different types of performance um so i still try i still try and watch as much cinema particularly as i possibly can because i think that's what i love most and the, the thing that i as a as an art form like i fall into and can just be completely like drenched in yeah. <laughs> do you know what i mean I, like to be in the cinema is like there's a there's a quote for i think it's from um, the philosopher uh, Ludwig, Ludwig Wittgenstein, who says that cinema is like a shower for your mind, oh. which I like. I think it's such a beautiful way of putting it, and completely agree uh, with that as a as an idea. Um, so, so that definitely, but also, uh, I f- I find the fact that I do photography as a sort of side as a hobby, really, like but as like a side creative project. I find that endlessly inspiring both the process of doing that for myself and and photographing people photographing what i'm doing where i'm at but also like studying photography studying those images all that kind of stuff i think actually as an actor i'm really just inspired a lot of the time by images a lot of the time when i'm doing work i'm sort of trying to recreate images in the work that i'm doing that are that mean something to me just often secretly in what i'm what i'm you know the scene that i'm in or the play that i'm in um, i'm trying to sort of try and weave some of that image language that i find so so interesting and so and helps me kind of understand the world try and weave that into what i'm doing as a performer um but it but a lot of the time it is it's just Easter eggs for if if people see it, then I'm super happy. But most of the time, I think they just that people are like he's sitting in that particular way. Who cares? Like, it's very um, interesting. Yeah. I've never heard someone describe their love of images influencing them in that way through their work because you would have to really be inside your brain, I think, to understand if you're sitting in a certain way or you're making a certain gesture, mm. or maybe you keep your head. At a certain angle, it could be anything. Mm-hmm. Like I can't. I'm, now I'm going to be. I'll be watching you intently, going and looking at your Instagram, going. Is, is that is that matching up? Is that matching What's up? That, is, that, is that a reference to this? Is it a reference to that? What, what is it? What is it? What is that reference to? What catches your eye then in terms of art or photography 
specifically like what kind of images do catch your eye i think the like the human body in space like in any space i think is a, like an amazing combination of things mm. uh, and yeah sure uh, maybe that's partly because i'm a performer and i like theater and I like film and that, that's what theater and film and dance and all that stuff is, is made of is like you, human beings in space in a space um or human beings in space maybe one day who knows yes. uh hopefully um yeah hopefully not too soon um because i'm not sure i'm ready f to do um to do that but i, I yeah it's i just even if it's just an image of people on the street, or it's a portrait, or it's, um, it's, it's a landscape, like the, the human body in it, I just find just such an, yeah, it's just it's something so amazing about that combination of things, um, because it's both so normal, but also when it's, I think when it's painted or photographed in a particular way or, you know, or, or filmed, suddenly it becomes this whole different thing. And that's what I think is so amazing about, you know, art generally, or, you know, the art that we do um, is that you're kind of transforming what it just is just the normal world into something that is for some reason that suddenly like heightened or different or makes you curious to look at it or you know or pulls you in in some way and the truth is i guess the normal the normal world is constantly like that um the problem is if we if we engaged with the normal world in that way every moment it would be completely exhausting i mean you um, would never get anything done <laughs> you'd never you wouldn't move from the place you were because you'd literally be going like the way the light is falling on that television is just so remote they just never do anything um yeah. but i think I, I that yeah the way that the way that the normal can become like so strange and magical uh it's, for me it's like it's just a never-ending uh, pleasure because it reminds you of what the world's like but it also just pulls you into this new alien space that's been created by the artist so yeah it's funny you describe it like that because i was watching american beauty again the other night just randomly stuck it on uh what you said reminded me of the scene uh where wes benley's character i can't remember what his character name is He's sitting on his bed and they're watching that video with you know, the famous scene of the, the bag yeah. in the wind. Mm -hmm. And I know it's been people have taken the piss out of it, you know, many, many times because I was watching it and I was I was going, Yeah, you know, it is it's a little bit, you know, extra. But I remember when I was a kid watching this in the cinema and and, and even now I was thinking, no, it's a it's a beautiful script. Like it's mm. that script and I bought the script recently, um, just a little second hand book I got off um, because I'm trying to learn how to write script right and one of the biggest things is to well, read the script and watch the films and stuff so mm. I, was, I was reading it and it's, it's just beautifully written like it's taking mm. this these ordinary very mundane lives and then stripping them back and seeing things that we don't usually see kind of thing and I, I love that so it's interesting you describe it that way because yeah we would never get anything done ah oh, yes I walked past Wimpy the other day and I was like I could, I could stand at Wimpy go oh they're, they're the, the red, the red hues of that wimpy. Just... Yeah, what a what an incredible, what an incredible palette. What a beautiful palette of reds this wimpy and white. represents. Yeah, <laughs> stunning, absolutely stunning. It's stunning. Yeah. We're not sponsored by wimpy, <laughs> although I'm happy uh, to get a gift voucher for Knickerbocker Glory. Me and James are big fans. Uh, uh, yeah, of Knickerbocker Glories yeah, generally. So yeah, specifically um, Knickerbocker. I'm into it. I'm, I'm into I'm into Knickerbocker glory. You said something just before we started talking about this, and it was about how you're not ready for space. And mm. I always think that we fall into two camps, and it's people that will say, "Oh my God, I would totally go to space tomorrow," and people like us who are like, "No, no, no." Uh, like, why is it you're saying no, nope, no to space? <laughs> Well, there are two. There are two reasons. One is like entirely personal and and probably cowardly, um, and the other one is is maybe more ideological. The first one is that I just I'm not sure I want to take the unnecessary risk. Sure. Uh, when you see the number of astronauts that died in the original space programs, you go, I'm not sure. Not I'm not sure I need to put myself in that situation um but the second yeah, the second reason is that i do genuinely believe at this point in human history we really should be focusing our efforts on our own planet um and i i'm not f fully convinced that the 
huge amounts of money being put into space travel particularly like because like, you know spacex i think it's amazing some of the stuff that's been discovered about our universe like that that, that kind of stuff is incredible but in terms of getting humans into space and getting humans a bit further away into space and a bit further away into space <laughs> i'm not i'm not 100 sure we couldn't spend that money more effectively to solve some of the terrible problems we have on our own planet so i think that's that's probably my overarching reason why i'm not really ready for space travel is because i think that i'd uh, i'd rather we insulated our houses or just tried to kind of distribute wealth a bit more effectively or something more positive <laughs> So imagine we live in Star Trek times, and uh, you can. Okay. So we're in Star Trek times now, and yeah. you can hundred percent go to space. You know, if you want, that could be a job. You could be an entertainer in space. You could work on a starship. Would you do it then? Well, you're 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 now describing a world in which going to space is as is like going on a Ryanair flight. So. Yeah, I, I think logically, yes, I would 100%. Uh, if, if, if space travel... So you're kind of making me out now to be a, a massive hypocrite because if, if I'm now like, well, no, I'd, I'd go to space if, it was, if it's chill. Yeah, uh, I'm the same, so don't worry. Like, hey, look, maybe it was chill vibes. True. I'm there. Yeah. It was chill vibes out there. But no, I, I agree with those points that you make because I think I feel like, you know... <laughs> The other day, for example, I was trying to figure out how to take a train somewhere in America from one state to the next. Can't do it. I feel like because it's their infrastructure in terms of their yeah. rail system is sure. appalling. Mm -hmm. um, and Americans on my Twitch chat were going, yeah, yeah, it's terrible. It's really crap here. You have to drive everywhere. And I thought what you were saying, I was like, yeah, if, if NASA just took that money, I just spent that on infrastructure in mm -hmm. every country. You know, our mm. insulated houses would just fed people. You know, mm. It would just really solve a lot of problems, you know. But um, as human beings, I always feel like we're always looking out the way and looking out the way, looking out the way. And I guess yeah. that's, you know, wanting changes. I suppose this is about podcasts. Is what's, this is what the podcast is about. It's what's, it's what's driven our human race forward to this point, I suppose, wanting something more. But would you say we need to slow down a bit? and just take a chill pill? Well, that's a really difficult question. I do <laughs> not know the answer to that because I think there's, there's, there are so many ways to look at w how we need to go forward as a, you know, as a species, um, what we need to do to try and undo some of the damage that we've already done, what we need to do to make sure that we kind of do less damage in the future to the planet that we live on. I so slowing down i think I, I think to be honest probably just on a daily basis we all probably need to slow down yeah. um and and try and consider how we can maybe live a slightly less um high velocity life or lifestyle if that's if that's something that we do um but I don't, yeah in terms of actually as a yeah as a, as as the people of the earth um we put I, we just i guess we all just need to because at the same time so we don't need to slow down in terms of our activism in terms of pushing forward for um you know po policies and um and and behaviors that are going to help us get to a both a more equitable and also a, a healthier planet um but we do, i guess we do need to slow down in certain ways i think we need to slow down for sure in in terms of how much we want in our to have yes. physically i think in terms of and and weirdly actually i do i always feel like there's a weird flip benefit to how much we're online now and how much of our like desires and lives and and you know the things that we want to create are online because i look i know there is a massive um climate impact with servers and data and all of that stuff sometimes just goes a bit under the radar but Sometimes when I go to, when I see someone mounting like a gigantic event, like a, I don't know, like a fashion event or a, a huge thing, like in, uh, you know, in the desert that they've built, like, you know, like Kristen Dior's doing a runway show in the desert. I'm like, I think this would be better in just in VR, guys. I think, 
and I think it would be less wasteful. <laughs> Let's just all get together in the chat room and enjoy this incredible, incredible vision that you've created. But maybe we didn't need to import like a thousand megatons of plywood over here or this or that. I think. I, I, I sort of hope that we we can find ways to build amazing worlds where we can play in in, in a way that's you know that works in, in terms of like energy um, online because I think that's kind of one of the things that we've learned is that you can you can put some of your material desires into a virtual into a virtual space you can and th then if we can find healthy ways to do that I think that's actually a really that's actually a really exciting thing I think that's where we're probably going to go in terms of your own evolution we talked about changes mm. like going forward you know we mentioned you've got a wee one now you know mm -hmm. and your dad you're still working there's no walls there's all yeah. of these things happening you're always busy you know and you're always moving forward how do you see and you got to this point, we started with you meeting your wife, you know, like having those lovely friends and that lovely, lovely time during the summer. How do you see yourself now going forward, you know, as a human, not just as an actor, but as a human, as a dad, as a husband? Where does your evolution take you next? What do you want to do next? Wow, this the 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 water in this hot pod is now super hot. Um, He's sweating. There's like a bead of sweat pouring down his head. Okay. What an incredible question! I, yeah, I, is there another podcast on earth that asks that deeper question? I, that I, I I would challenge the podcast verse to to come up with as deeper question as that. What is your evolution going forward? I mean, obviously, and. In some ways, thankfully, now a huge amount of who I am is a dad. And I think that, and we, we, my wife and I and our, our son, are, uh, we're a very early part of that journey. So I think to an extent that we're gonna hopefully define that together. And actually, and I, I think that is my genuine answer is that I hope that together we'll just kind of work that out and um i'm i feel like we're making all the right decisions at the moment and taking all the right steps i know that we'll, there'll be mistakes and i know that we'll that like with any like in any kind of life but i think particularly with parenting um and being a very new parent therefore being a very inexperienced parent um i know that it's even saying oh there's going to be mistakes it's like a, almost like a stupid thing to say almost like a stupid thing to say um but i I just the evolu evolution that I kind of I can see going forward is um, like a really a life where we really try and be a unit and be a, you know be a family and, and find a way to to do to do the things that we want to do as much as we can, but in the context of all the other things that each of us want to do. It's it's kind of that I listened to this amazing discussion about um, about. Uh, evolution, actually. So this comes back literally to your question, which is uh, the, the dynamic of evolution being one of uh, competition is sort of, you know, that's the way that we see it and the way that we've seen it for a very long time. And there is, I think, a movement in science towards a re thinking of that process as not competition, but rather as like synthesis and symb symbiosis. So it's not that species compete and the top one comes out on top it's more that species work together and the ones that don't work out with the other ones don't work and therefore they you know that that species often then tails away um and um i i, I kind of i feel like that's a that, that's a really lovely way of trying to think about life is like if how can i fit in to all of the other people around me that i love how can i fit into this world that i love how can i how can i contribute uh, you know, to this general symbiosis of people working together, hopefully to create balance and create, you know, generally a good dish world. Um, and I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to start small, start small, me, my wife, yes. our, our child. Let, we'll start there, see if we can see, see if I can work on that. And hopefully that will generally contribute to a kind of a, a kind of symbiotic life as you, much as possible. You will, because it sounds like you've got your great team, you know, so and that's that is the best way. If you've got like a strong person by your side, you can go forward in a strong way. Um, but, you know, it, you know what I like about this podcast, that every episode is very different because it always reflects 
the character of the person mm. I'm speaking to, which is exactly what I wanted for this podcast. The, the last episode that I recorded with Robotron, which by the time everyone hears this, you'll have heard the Robotron one, is chaotic. He doesn't even answer the question about the decision until about 30 minutes, almost 20 minutes in. Uh, mm. This has been lovely because it's been quite a deep chat. I, don't, I know you've maybe didn't expect it, but... No, it's been lovely. But it's like how personalities bring things out of each other as well. And I always like that. That's what I'm interested in most about mm. someone who interviews people. I'm like, mm, mm. how what is our chemistry going to be like? now today wherever yeah, so yeah. it's been a lovely chat we, we've gone from like you know the decision to uh, flute club um and the evolution of james <laughs> so. the evolution of james yeah what a journey thank thank you so much thank you for thank you for taking me into the hot pod and and just cooking me so gently in here it was like a sous it was like a, a slow sous vide and i'm so pleased that flute club came out of it and, and anyone who's listening if they want to join flute club remember the first rule is that you don't talk about flute club uh, but you're always welcome in in the club that both me and claire are made in or aren't we because you can't talk about it so who knows i don't know i've heard about it i think can't say <laughs> can't say james tell us where can we find you online where can people follow you online so most of my work I put out on Instagram still, uh, which is uh, at Northcote J. Um, North is like the direction. Coat is like, I don't know, it's C-O-T-E. Um, so Northcote J. Uh, you can also find me on the same handle on TikTok, although I am absolutely terrible there. Uh, as Claire's already mentioned, I stream with Claire and Mark on No Walls Live on Twitch. Uh, so definitely check that out because that's where we're doing a lot of our, I don't know, our, our kind of our most pioneering work currently. <laughs> um, and and James uh, loves so streaming. He loves it. He's a proper streamer now. I can see it in your well, eyes. You can see it. I, yeah, I know, you can see it in my. You can see it in my ring light reflected eyes. Uh, <laughs> I love that you love streaming so much. So do please go follow James. Um, it's, James, it's been wonderful chatting to you. This has been a really, really good episode. Really great. Thank you for having me. No problem, um, guys. Uh, please make sure you subscribe to the podcast on YouTube and Spotify and all other places where you can find podcasts. My name is Clara. This is James, and this has been hot pod time machine we'll see you again soon bye